Dear colleagues, my name is Barbara Lison, IFLAS president-elect, and I will be your chair for today's meeting. As you will be aware, COVID-19 has set up plans and it is with great disappointment that IFLAS president, Christine McKenzie, is unable to travel from Australia and be with us today. However, you will hear from her later in this meeting. Welcome to the IFLA General Assembly taking place in The Hague, Netherlands. I welcome those few who are here in the room with us and those who are following virtually via Zoom or YouTube. This is a very special General Assembly. Due to the current situation in the Netherlands regarding COVID-19 with high rates of infection, and in line with official Dutch health advice and a desire to avoid any IFLA members exposing themselves to risk unnecessarily, we had to encourage members to avoid coming to The Hague. Nonetheless, we are committed to ensuring that your voice can be heard. And so we urged you to make use of the possibilities for proxy voting. I am glad to say Many of IFLA members did. In this extraordinary situation, IFLA also took further actions in order to help you to participate as best possible. Therefore, we are now live streaming the General Assembly. We offered the opportunity to ask questions regarding the subjects on the agenda of the IFLA 2020 General Assembly Answers were collected, reviewed, and published on a dedicated web page on 30th October. Many thanks again, and let's start the General Assembly, which I have the honor to officially open now. With me on the stage for the meeting is Secretary General Gerald Leitner, who will support me, the IFLA Treasurer Antonia Arahova and we are connected also with our parliamentarian, Martin Wade. Item two on our agenda is the appointment of TELUS. I ask the Secretary General to provide more information. Gerald, please. Members, given the unusual situation, there will, there will be no TELUS at this meeting. Helen Mandel, the Deputy Secretary General, will count the votes of any members present and the votes of the proxy holders. Thank you, Secretary General. Item three. Oh. Thank you, Secretary General. Item three is the establishment of a quorum. I ask the Secretary General to provide more information. At the beginning of the meeting, there were 136 national and international association members who have paid their fees for 2020 and are not in areas. For a quorum, we need 50% of this number plus one, namely 69 members to be present or represented through the proxies. I'm very pleased to announce that 85 associations are represented today Therefore, Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you for the information. I now move to item four, the adoption of the agenda. Secretary General, please. The agenda for the General Assembly meeting was sent to all members in good standing in August 2020, as required by the statutes. In accordance with Article 9.6, the business of the meeting shall normally be limited to those items appearing on the agenda issued with the convening notice for the meeting. As per Article 961, additional items of an exceptional and urgent character may be added at the discretion of the president or other person who is acting as the chair of the meeting with the consent of the majority of the members present or represented. Such resolutions have not been received for this meeting, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I now call for a mover and a seconder for the adoption of the agenda. 
Thank you, Lily Knibbler, as a mover, and Antonia as a seconder. Thank you. The motion as presented is moved and seconded, and I will now ask if the meeting adopts the agenda. We will do this via a formal vote. Please stay with us while the vote takes place. The result of the voting is 1,379 in favor, no abstentions and no against. So the agenda is adopted. Thank you. We now move to item number five, the minutes of the previous meeting held in Athens, Greece on the 28th and 29th August, 2019. Secretary General, please. The draft minutes have been distributed to all delegates through emails containing directions to the papers available in the General Assembly papers, which were distributed on the EFLA website. Are there any connections? Seeing none, I now call for a mover and a seconder that the minutes of the General Assembly meeting held in Athens, Greece on the 28th and 29th August 2019 be approved. Yeah, Lily Knibbler is a second uh, mover and Tonya Arachovar as a seconder. So thank you very much. We will now approve the minutes via a formal vote again. Please stay with us while the vote takes place. The result of the voting is 1,379 votes in favor, no vote against and no abstentions. With this, the minutes of the previous meeting held in Athens, Greece 28, 29, August 2019 are approved. Thank you very much. At this point in the meeting, we would like to remember colleagues who have passed away since the conference in Athens. To the members here and watching online, we each are part of a profession that can change people's lives. We remember these colleagues with gratitude and appreciation for their contributions to our profession and their communities. We now move on to item seven and the presentation of the report of the president. Dear colleagues, as already announced, our president, Christine McKenzie, is not able to join us today due to travel restriction as a result of COVID-19 restrictions. However, she is with us in spirit and will give her report as a video message.
Dear colleagues, dear friends, I am honoured to deliver this President's report to the General Assembly. In Australia, we acknowledge the owners of the land on which we meet. Today, I am presenting this report from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge all Indigenous colleagues who have joined us today. The major IFLA project undertaken this year has been the governance review. The new governing board began work at its first meeting in August in Athens on this third stage of the IFLA roadmap. This was a governance review to ensure that IFLA has the best possible structure to achieve its strategic aims. We wanted to develop a new structure that will enable a more inclusive, transparent and effective IFLA. Later in this meeting, I will present a report on the governance review and the new structure, the result of the work done by all of us to achieve this ambition. The last months of 2019 and early 2020 will be remembered as the time before the world changed when our libraries were open and we were able to meet in person, attend conferences and workshops and move freely around. Back when travel was still possible, I attended a number of important gatherings focused on outcomes of the United Nations 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals that also emphasised my presidential theme, Let's Work Together. These included conferences of significant IFLA partners, the International Council of Archives met in Adelaide, United Cities and Local Government, UCLG, is the global voice of local and regional governments, which supports cities and regions to achieve the goals of the UN 2030 agenda. I attended their conference in Durban, South Africa, and reach preliminary agreement on a memorandum of understanding between our two organisations. Another strategic IFLA partner is UNESCO, and I gave a keynote at the conference in Doha, organised by the UNESCO office and Qatar National Library to discuss the state of documentary heritage preservation and conservation in the Arab world. I also spoke at the International Conference on Digital Landscape in New Delhi, which emphasised the transformation to digital and the urgency of working towards a sustainable world and reducing inequality and the digital divide. Sadly, all the physical conferences and events arranged and so keenly anticipated were cancelled from March. However, since April, I have been to more places than I ever thought possible, even to Fiji and Singapore on the same day. The opportunities of reaching out to more members and the global library field have greatly expanded thanks to the rapid adaptation to working and meeting virtually. I have participated in global, regional and local conferences, workshops, summits, forums, graduations, and other events in many countries. It has been an enriching and engaging experience to be part of so many gatherings. In this unprecedented year, I think that there are some common themes emerging. Our global library field is very good at working together and sharing information. The pandemic is highlighting and also hastening the changing role of libraries. We are innovative and creative in our responses there is a new appreciation of libraries. We are seen as partners in delivery of services and as important community resources. And there are significant concerns about funding into the future. Most of all, we are resilient and we can pivot with the best of them. I would like to thank my colleagues on the governing board. I am full of admiration for their good natured acceptance of the challenges of meeting and working virtually across so many time zones. Despite all, we have together achieved a great deal this year and we have also had to make significant and hard decisions. Thank you, President-elect Barbara Luson, 
Treasurer Tonya Arahova, Professional Committee Chair Vicki McDonald and the other Executive Committee members and all Governing Board members. Thank you to our Secretary General, Gerald Leitner, who has worked tirelessly to ensure that the best outcomes possible have been achieved for IFLA in very difficult and complex situations. The IFLA staff continue to do great work and have shown how adaptable they are. And to all of you, everyone who has contributed so generously to keeping IFLA the global voice of libraries through your work on the professional units and in so many capacities, thank you all. Let's keep working together in these strange times to make libraries as good as they can be. Dear Chris, thank you so much for your report and the tremendous work and leadership you are providing for our Federation under the most unusual and challenging conditions. Now I invite our Secretary General, Gerald Leitner, to report on operational matters for 2019 and major activities for 2020. Gerald, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will do with pleasure, especially because 2019 was a fantastic year for IFLA. But please allow me first to say some words to the current situation. I know it is, is a cliche, but this report is given certainly not at the time, nor in the place, nor in the format I would have expected last time we met in August 2019 in Athens for an outstanding World and Library Information Congress. The 14 months that have passed since then have been tough. Here at the beginning, I want to send my condolences to all those who have lost friends, family, colleagues, who have faced upheaval and loss, and loss across the field. While what I will be saying is obviously focused on all that Evla achieved in 2019 as set out in our annual report, it is of course difficult to do this without thinking about what has followed and all of its impacts on the way we work. However, I would argue that much of what shines through in all that we achieved together in 2019 is also there in 2020. The importance of having the structures in place to work together, the resilience, the resourcefulness of our field, our commitment to serving our communities in the best way possible, and our determination to keep moving forwards to build a stronger and more united library field powering literary informed and participatory societies. Because while COVID-19 has clearly brought changes and uncertainty, the library field is no stranger to disruption. Maybe not as rapid, but not less significant or far-reaching. In a changed world, libraries have changed themselves, developed new services and new ways of supporting communities addressed new issues. In doing this, libraries have benefited from what exchange, collaboration, and the development and the definition of standards and guidelines can bring. All that IFLA is best at. In turn, to best support the field, we have responded by working to become more inclusive, more effective, more transparent. And as I hope you will agree, all we have done in 2019 helps us deliver on this mission to inspire, engage, enable, and connect the global library field. I'm sure you will agree that 2019 was another great year for IFLA. The report that you have received cannot really do justice to all of the excellent work that takes place across our Federation. In providing a summary, however, I hope it nonetheless gives you an idea of all that you, our members, our volunteers, our governing board, our headquarters have achieved together. Last year represented a key milestone in EFLA's transformation, launched with our Global Vision Initiative in 2017. With the end goal of ensuring that EFLA can continue to do the best for its members and the global library field as a whole, we started 
by holding an unprecedented conversation, the biggest in the history of our field. Our goal, to take the pulse of the profession globally, to understand your concerns and priorities, your values and views. 2019 was the year that these contributions, once again, building on a rich conversation with our field, took form as the EFLA strategy. In making the shift from vision to strategy, EFLA has given itself both a roadmap and a framework. A roadmap for our own work across our professional units, at our governing board and headquarters, in our work with our members but also a framework available to the library field as a whole in order to advance cooperation and identify synergies. Because our strategy should indeed follow the mission it sets for EFLA itself to inspire, engage, enable, and connect the global library field. However, this strategy, any strategy, is only as good as its implementation. Building understanding of what it contains, of what it can do, was and remains a key priority. Indeed, before the end of 2019, we had already taken the strategy on the road to the Latin America and Caribbean and Middle East and North Africa regions. This demonstrated the potential of the strategy both to build engagement with EFLA and as a tool for members in their own work. I'm glad to say we are already seeing the results of this. We have seen great mobilization from our professional units who have used the strategy intensively in defining action plans and have since then been busier than ever in bringing new projects to life. A crucial part of this implementation process is our governance review. Indeed, this is not just a single pillar of our work, but rather a facilitator of success across the board. Because with our governance review, we are aiming to give EFLA the tools, the structure it needs to deliver on the ambition of our strategy. This is the third major step of our transformation, from vision to strategy to governance. As our president will explain shortly, this work has again been based on your views, your input. Because we cannot build a more inclusive, effective and transparent EFLA without an inclusive, effective, transparent process. And of course, we cannot build it without you. As I have already underlined, one of the most thrilling parts of our work on our strategy and on our governance re review has been that it has involved all parts of EFLA as a truly collective effort. Yet this is clearly not all that we have done. I of course encourage you to read through our annual report, but I wanted to highlight just some examples. Our first new strate strategic direction focuses on strengthening the global voice of libraries. EFLA has a unique role in building understanding of the key role of libraries among decision makers at the global level. So we launched the Buenos Aires Declaration on Access to Information with signatures from ministers and representatives of 13 countries and spoke on two events at the UN High Level Political Forum in July in New York. We have continued to engage at the World Intellectual Property Organization and UNESCO and established links with UN Habitat and others. Yet just as important is our work to support advocacy by our members. We launched toolkits on getting libraries involved in national literacy strategies and national broadband strategies and published positions on public lending rights and censorship all designed to support you in your work. Our second strategic direction is inspire and enhance professional practice. Our library map of the world celebrated its second birthdays with libraries in 171 countries now engaged and data from 127 countries on the map with a total of 2.6 million libraries counted. 
And of course, a highlight of our congr Congress last year was the launch of our idea stores, open for you to draw inspiration for your own work. We also released our second development and access to information report and new standards on public internet access in libraries and establishing digital unification projects. In the heritage field, we launched work to adapt preservation standards to ensure that they are useful for everyone, especially for you. Our third strategic direction includes our work to connect and empower the field. At the heart of our work here is our Congress. I want to offer my warmest thanks to our colleagues in the Greek National Committee for putting on such a great event and of course to all of you who attended for your energy and your engagement. Yet so much else has been going on to bring people together to share ideas. The President's meeting in Buenos Aires in May under the leadership of Gloria Perez Salmoron was a great opportunity to share ideas with librarians from across the region. Our regional strategy workshops have helped us go further still. And of course, the work of our professional units brings our field together around the year. Our fourth strategic direction is to optimize our own organization. Our governance review has clearly been at the heart of this. But 2019 was also a great year for our membership. By the end of the year, we had members in 155 countries moving us closer than ever to our goal of members in every UN member state. As you can see, there is so much going on and this is just a fraction of the whole. None of this would be possible without you, our members and volunteers. You, your energy, your ideas, your experience is what makes EFLA what it is. Thank you so much. I must also thank with pleasure my team, the EVLA headquarters team who support me and you with such dedication and skill. And I want to offer a particular thanks to our outgoing governing board and especially our president 2017 to 2019, Gloria Perez Salmoron, who has provided and continued to provide so much inspiration to so many in our field. You and the whole governing board who completed your terms in 2019 have had such a positive impact on EFLA. And I want to thank also our current governing board for all the time and wisdom you contribute. Here I want to reserve a special thank you to Christine McKenzie, our president 2019 to 2021, who works so hard for EFLA for libraries. Your motto, let's work together, has never been more important. And under your guidance, I think we are setting new standards for collaboration and cooperation across our profession. Thank you all so much. And please don't forget, we all together are IFLA. IFLA's momentum hasn't stopped and is building on the global vision and IFLA strategy to bring the field together. I'm particularly pleased to see the willingness of the profession to share ideas of how to deal with COVID-19 and still provide the best for our users. Now we come to item number nine of the agenda, and I invite the treasurer, Antonia Arachova, to report on the annual accounts of 2019. My dearest colleagues, my IFLA family, I hope you are all very well and you're all safe and healthy in these extraordinary, strange times because of the COVID-19. I'm very happy to contact you even by distance and I'm honored uh, to read uh, the treasurer's report uh, which brings good news uh, for IFLA as an organization and I'm so happy to communicate with you this good news. 
Well, the financial result of the year 2019 shows a surplus of 27,041 euros compared to a budgeted surplus of only 267 euros. The surplus of 2019 brings our general reserves to 1 million. 551,643 euros and earn mark um, reserves to 56,940 euros. This level of reserves is close to the level of reserves required under our reserves policy. These reserves are an important asset for IFLA to secure our work and sustainability into the future. So, the total expenditure for the year 2019 was 1,654,982 euros compared to 1,892,860 euros in 2018. The decrease of um, 237,878 euros can be mainly explained as follows. First reason, decrease in expenditure for the IAP, International Advocacy Program, in 2019 of 245,139 euros. The expenditure for the IAP could be decreased by 245,139 euros as costs were covered by Siegel. Second, decrease of 43,002 euros in staff expenses. Third reason, no donation to Siegel in 2019 instead of uh, 70,000 euros in 2018. Fourth, in 2019, the subsidiary IFLA Holding BV suffered a deficit of um, 46,152 euros. And fifth reason, increase of 20,873 euros in costs for professional activities and projects. The total income for the year 2019 was 1.682,023 euros compared to 2.183,797 euros in 2018. The decrease of 501,774 um, uh, euros can be mainly explained as follows. Uh, first, negative result in um, 2019 of the subsidiary of La BV of 46,152 euros. Second, decrease in expenditure for the IAP program in 2019. Um, third, decrease of 41,227 euros in contributions for, for core activities. And fourth, decrease of 44,557 euros in fees received for management of other projects. Since 2012, IFLA's World Library International Congress has been operating through IFLA Holding BV and its subsidiaries, of which IFLA is the sole shareholder. Therefore, the consolidated company results are included in the annual financial statement of IFLA. The IFLA WLIC surplus showed a decreasing trend between 2014 and 2017, 2014, uh, we had a surplus of 126,364 um, euros. Uh, in 2015, 55,000 um, surplus. 2016, around 8,000 surplus. 2017, uh, 18,488 um, euros deficit. The WLIC of 2018 in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, however, resulted in a positive financial result of 158,588 euros. The WLIC of Athens, Greece, in 2019, our last um, uh, IFLA uh, Congress, so did a, a deficit of 46,152 euros. Thanks to funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, in 2019, IFLA was able to spend 463,573 euros on key initiatives involving the International Advocacy Programme. Furthermore, IFLA works strongly together with um, Stitch 
using IFLA Global Libraries, Siegel, on projects primarily funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through its legacy grant and data grant. Therefore, a part of IFLA staff and overhead expenses is jointly carried between IFLA and Siegel. The past trend of decreasing membership um, incomes during 2014 and 2017 has been turned around in 2018 with um, an increase of 35,358 euros in 2018 and an increase of 26,249 euros in 2019. But it remains important for IFLA to explore additional funding opportunities in the coming years to ensure our ongoing viability. IFLA is very grateful to its member organizations and individuals who support us through donations and hosting activities and to the organizations that support our initiatives and projects through grant funding. In 2019, based on a proposal by IFLA's governing board, the General Assembly passed a resolution increasing IFLA's membership fees in line with the um, consumer price index in the Netherlands. Going into 2020, IFLA has continued to carry out its work to provide a wide range of services to members in line with our strategy. Our organization has nonetheless been hit by the cancellation of our Congress in Dublin this year, obliging tough budgeting decisions in order to support our long-term financial sustainability. In this context, IFLA's governing board held a concerted discussions at its meeting in September about the best approach to fees in 2020. As a result, while underlining the importance of ensuring the IFLA's membership fees keep up with inflation over time in order to ensure financial sustainability, the governing board recognized the need to stand with members by exceptionally freezing fees for 2021 at 2020 levels. Dear friends, my dear IFLA family, I think positively by nature, and I'm sure better times will come. As a result, uh, the, uh, the ancient Greek philosopher has said when he was asked, what is hope? It's a dream of an awake man, he answered. And we, we, the GB, uh, the executive committee, the secretary general, the, the treasurer, uh, the president-elect and our president, this GB, we are awake and we are dreaming of a better structure, better organized, better fun functioned IFLA, and we work on this. I'm happy and honored to continue the tradition of our president and president elect, both having served as treasurers and bringing you uh, this good news, very good news about IFLA sustainability. And I would like to warmly thank our Secretary General for his efforts, our President, uh, President-elect, and all this wonderful uh, team of the IFLA GB. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, let's work together to make our IFLA, our family, stronger and stronger, and more inclusive, and more participatory. My warmest wishes, in my IFLA friends, and please stay healthy. Bye. Thank you, Tanya. We have not received any questions regarding the treasurer's report before the meeting. Are there any questions from members present in the room? Seeing none, I now call for a mover and a seconder for the motion that the 2019 annual accounts be approved. The motion as presented is moved by Lili Knibberer and seconded by Tonya Arachova. Thank you. I will now ask if the meeting approves the 2019 annual accounts. We will do this via formal vote. Please stay with us while the vote takes place.
Thank you. The result is 1,379 in favor, none against and no abstentions. So the 2019 annual accounts are approved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Treasurer, as well. And now item 10. We are coming to a highlight of our General Assembly. And I ask the Secretary General to present the IFLA honors and awards for 2020. Gerald, please. This year, the governing board decided that despite the lack of a conference, IFLA should still acknowledge substantial contributions to the library field through its honors and awards. Therefore, I'm delighted to present our outstanding awardees. The EFLA Scroll of Appreciation is awarded to members who have given distinguished service to EFLA. EFLA presents a Scroll of Appreciation to Genevieve Clavel Marin in grateful recognition of her distinguished contributions to EFLA and the promotion of national libraries, particularly in support of the role of libraries in the information society. Genevieve, can you give us a few words, please? Dear colleagues, greetings from Switzerland. My name is Genevieve Clavel, and I have recently retired from the Swiss National Library in Bern, where I was responsible for international cooperation. I am very honoured to receive this award today and wish to thank you for this privilege. The terms I served on the IFLA National Library Standing Committee and on the Governing Board and the collaboration with a wide range of IFLA committees and groups, most recently in the Global Vision Activities, has always given welcome opportunities and challenges to learn and especially to make new friendships with colleagues across the world. I wish to thank the Swiss National Library, whose directors have given me the time, support and encouragement to engage fully in IFLA activities. And thank you, IFLA HQ staff, for all the support and infrastructure you have provided online and in person. It has always been a pleasure to see you in The Hague or during WLIC and I hope we will once again have the opportunity to meet up. Thank you again, et à la prochaine. Genevieve, you have been such a strong supporter and contributor to IFLA in so many ways, and this award is so very well deserved. Congratulations. IFLA presents a scroll of appreciation to Victoria Owen, in grateful recognition of her distinguished contribution to IFLA as a committed advocate for approved copyright provisions for libraries and for her role in the implementation of the Marrakesh Treaty and increasing access to information for people with a print disability around the world. Now let's hear from Victoria, please. Hello, my name is Victoria Owen and I'm a librarian at the University of Toronto in the role of Information Policy Scholar Practitioner. I'm a visiting program officer with the Association of Research Libraries and the Canadian Association of Research Libraries for the implementation of the Marrakesh Treaty. Thank you for this award. I'm very pleased that our work on accessibility is being recognized and I invite you, my colleagues worldwide, to join me in using the policy tools at our disposal the National Laws and the IFLA Getting Started Guide to Advance Access. Please adapt the guide to your national laws and distribute it to librarians on the front lines. Our role as librarians is essential to the success of the Marrakesh Treaty, and we hold the key for access for people with print disabilities. Thank you very much for this recognition, and I look forward to working with you to implement this level of access worldwide. Victoria, congratulations and thank you for your valued contribution, particularly to people with print disabilities. What you do makes a real difference to the lives of people around the world. IFLA presents a scroll of appreciation to Vincent Roberts in grateful recognition of his extensive contribution to IFLA and in fostering international cooperation among libraries particularly in the Asia-Oceania region. 
and on issues of internet governance and digital policy. Winston, can we hear from you, please? I am grateful to IFLA for awarding me this scroll, but also for having given me so many opportunities for learning and professional development over the past 40 years, which is because I was involved with IFLA for 20 years when I lived in Europe, and I have been involved for another 20 years after coming back to New Zealand. This recognition is not for me alone, but it's also for the efforts of many teams that I've had the pleasure of working with in IFLA. Some of those teams you can see in the photographs which are being shown. The volunteer interpreters, a great bunch of people with whom I began my involvement with IFLA. And later, the Africa Committee of IFLA, the Asia Oceania Committee, of which I've since become an elected member. I also learned a lot from the amazing and talented staff of IFLA headquarters. The persons have changed over the years, but their values and professionalism have not changed. They even encouraged me to learn their language when I lived in Holland. I also learned a lot about national libraries. I learned from the inspirational Morris Lyon and others in the British Library, and from the experts of the Universal Bibliographic Control Program when I worked in London. At IFLA headquarters, I learned from the wonderful Christ van Wesemael, whom I succeeded as coordinator of professional activities. I learned a lot from supporting the work of CDNL when my boss, Penny Carnaby in New Zealand, was the chair of that organization. And in recent years, I have had the pleasure of learning from IFLA colleagues around Asia and the Pacific, in huge cities, on huge continents and small islands. This is an important point because we are living in the Pacific century. I'm grateful to IFLA and to the National Library of New Zealand for giving me the opportunity to shape, even in a small way, library sector relations with UNESCO in respect of policies around the way we use and develop applications of the internet. I believe it is essential to bridge the gap between the library sector and the internet community and other communities of information professionals. In daily work in New Zealand, I've always been conscious of the need to bridge the digital divide. The only answer to that is collaboration, to develop resources for education, for social good, for communities, and policies for equitable access to information through the internet. Thank you again. Winston, from an IFLA president from this part of the world, Thank you for your commitment to IFLA and your work on behalf of libraries, particularly in Asia Oceania. IFLA presents a scroll of appreciation to Milna Villa in grateful recognition of her distinguished and extensive contributions to IFLA and global cataloging standards, in particular for her work on the modernization of Unimark and innovation in technical standards. Now let's hear from Milna. Hello, I'm Mirna Ville, retired professor from the University of Zadar, Croatia. I'm deeply honored by the award of the IFLA Scroll of Appreciation, for which I would like to thank you all. However, this scroll doesn't go for my work only. It also goes for all those Croatian and international colleagues with whom I've been working for the past 40 years. So, I would like to share it with all of them, many of whom have remained my lifelong friends. I would also like to thank my family, who had deep understanding for my commitments to the values of IFLA and librarianship. Thank you. Myrna, congratulations 
and thank you for your specialist and important technical work. Without the work you do, we cannot promote universal access to information. IFLA presents a scroll of appreciation to Eve Woodbury in grateful recognition of her distinguished contribution to IFLA and as an advocate for the rights of libraries and their users in the areas of copyright, intellectual property, and e-landing. Eve, may I ask you for a few words? I'm Eve Woodbury. I am currently the Chair of the Public Lending Rights Committee for Australia and have been involved with CLM at IFLA since 2007. Initially as a member of the committee and from 2015 to 2019 as chair. I am delighted and honoured to be being awarded the scroll of appreciation and to be joining other members of IFLA who have received the same uh, recognition. My time at IFLA began in 2004 with the Congress in Buenos Aires. And during that time, I have come to appreciate the international context in which libraries operate and also particularly intellectual property and copyright. I've made many friends at IFLA and worldwide and acquaintances as well, and I appreciate their experience and knowledge. I have, it has been my pleasure to organise sessions and to chair sessions and to present at sessions and also to chair the CLM meeting and part of their meetings. So thank you again for this honour. Eve, thank you for contributing your expertise to the profession in the very challenging area of copyright where perseverance is required. Congratulations on this award. The EVLA Medal is awarded to a person or organisation that has made a distinguished contribution either to EVLA or to the international librarianship. The EVLA Medal is awarded to Guy Berthion. Guy Berthion is a past national librarian at Library and Archives Canada. Guy is recognised for his achievements for national libraries and his influence in advocating for partnerships with the broader documentary heritage community. He served as chair of IFLA's National Library Section from 2015 to 2019 and created closer ties with CDNL, the Conference of Directors of National Libraries. He was instrumental in implementing IFLA's Digital Unification Working Group, whose work culminated in the IFLA guidelines for setting up a digital unification project. As the world grapples with documentary cultural heritage that can be scattered across continents, these guidelines provide starting points for libraries wanting to collaborate on digitally documenting their combined collections as a cohesive set of resources. He was also instrumental in the Francophone Digital Network, which brings together 27 Francophone libraries and archives across all regions of the world. Ifla has benefited significantly from his energy, expertise, and engagement. I ask Guy to say a few words. Hi, I'm Guy Bertion, librarian and archivist of Canada Emeritus. Dear colleagues, chers collègues, first, I want to thank the Ifla Governing Board for bestowing this honor on me. I also want to express my gratitude to the Canadian colleagues who nominated me, my friends Leslie Weir, Victoria Owen, and Catherine McColgan. This recognition by IFLA is even more meaningful to me because it comes from an organization for which I have the greatest respect and admiration. One of the first things I did after being appointed President and CEO of the National Library and Archives of Quebec was to attend the IFLA Congress, which took place in Milan in August of 2009. And the very last thing I did as librarian and archivist of Canada, 10 years later, was to participate in the Athens Congress in August 2019. Between these two moments in space and time, there are 10 years of passion for national libraries, for their roles, their influence, and their future. In work, as in love, one gets as much out of something as one invests in it. 
That's why I wanted to be involved in the National Library section. Therefore, in 2015, I proposed to my colleague Geneviève Clavel of the Swiss National Library that she run for the position of chair and that I would put my name forward for the position of secretary of the section. Geneviève told me it should be the opposite, namely because the secretary does all the heavy lifting. So I let myself be convinced by such an impressive argument and I ran for the position of chair. And all kidding aside, Geneviève was totally right. All those who have participated in the work of the standing committee know that it is she who has done most of the work during the four years we have devoted to it. I want to take this occasion to salute and thank Geneviève for her tireless contribution. During our mandate, Geneviève and I were especially keen to create linkages between our standing committee and CDNL, the Conference of Directors of National Libraries. Let me thank the chairs of CDNL, my friend and mentor, Kai Eckholm, and Lili Knibbler of the National Library of the Netherlands for facilitating this close collaboration. One of the most important responsibilities entrusted to me during the past years was the role of chair of the Digital Unification Working Group. Digital unification is a very sensitive subject and it's for that reason that I'm so proud that our guidelines for setting up a digital unification project were approved by the EFLA governing board last year. Most of the work of the working group was carried out by Isabel Nifniger of the BNF with the collaboration of Christian Jensen of the British Library. I thank them both very warmly, as well as Stephen Weiber, who was the linchpin of our working group. Working in the library and archives community over the last decade, at a time when these institutions were flourishing like never before because of the digital revolution, was a unique opportunity. And for this unique opportunity to be accompanied by honors as prestigious as the one I'm receiving today far exceeds my wildest dreams. So therefore, today, I can say, quoting French author Albert Camus, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. Thank you. Merci. Guy, congratulations on this well-deserved honour. You have helped immensely in strengthening and fostering IFLA's partnership with national libraries, and for that, we thank you. The IFLA Medal is also awarded to Inga London. Inga London has served on a range of EFLA sections and on the EFLA governing board from 2011 to 2015. During this time, she was deeply involved in the development of the EFLA Trend Report, an influential document that aimed to prompt librarians to think differently about the environments they work in and possible futures. Inga was the director of the Stockholm City Library and her drive was to bring a more user-driven perspective to the international library field. She brought IFLA, the Swedish Library Association and the Kenyan Library Associations together as part of IFLA's Building Strong Library Associations program that has resulted in a long-standing partnership between the two associations and IFLA. Inga has also helped others to learn from the experience of Sweden in developing national legislation to support libraries and their activities. As president of the Swedish Library Association, Inga played a vital and major role in bringing the IFLA Congress to Gothenburg in 2010. She worked with the Global Libraries Program, supporting projects, mentoring new professionals in developing countries and regions, another demonstration of her commitment to international librarianship. She is known as a positive force within the IFLA community, sharing her expertise with colleagues around the world and is a worthy recipient of the IFLA Medal. Inga, the floor is yours. Let's work together. That's the motto of our president, Christine McKenzie. That's a beautiful motto, describing the meaning and the value of IFLA, of the library associations, of our profession. Dear friends, 
dear friends and colleagues out there. My name is Inge Lundén and I come from Sweden. I am so very honored to be here today to accept the IFLA medal. Although I'd like to meet all of you personally, I can feel your warmth and collegial friendship. Let's work together. Why? If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Libraries are both very local and at the same time very international. We want to reach far. To work internationally is rewarding. It was for me, it was for my organization. The question is the same all over the world. What can your library do to improve people's life? I give you an example. When people ask about my favorite library, I tell them about one of the libraries in the Air and Land Information Network, Alien, outside Nairobi. The library building itself was only some containers and a mast for the internet. From that, they worked together with teachers, kids, farmers, housewives, and shepherds to create the best possible impact on the life of the community. That was the inspiration for our next library in Stockholm, the much awarded suburban Shista Library. Making partnerships with the Muslim school, the tech companies, the football club, the street poetry. Let's work together in library associations. And the greater cooperation between library associations is IFLA. IFLA at its best is a di as diverse as the world we are working in. Together with the legacy from Global Libraries, Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, IFLA will encourage and support new networks of creative and brave emerging library innovators. Embracing the diversity of the global librarianship and learning from it. Working together with partners locally and globally finding new answers to the everlasting questions. What can we do to improve people's life? Thank you. Inga, my kind, generous and strong friend, I'm delighted to congratulate you on this award. You have changed lives around the world and inspired many in the profession to think creatively and look beyond boundaries. Your colleagues and IFLA, thank you. My personal congratulations to all the recipients of IFLA's honours this year. Each one is thoroughly deserving of their recognition and we look forward to meeting and congratulating them again. We move now to item number 11 on the agenda, and I ask our president, Christine McKinsey, to give her address. Dear Christine, please. Dear colleagues, dear friends, this part of the General Assembly is to provide you with an overview of the governance review that has been undertaken over the past year. At its heart, IFLA is led by its people, you, our members and volunteers. You elect us, the governing board, to oversee the work of our federation. And you don't just elect us, your ongoing contributions and input continually guide us in what we do. It is your voice that comes across through the global vision. It is your priorities that underpin our strategic plan. And it is your needs and concerns that are, that are at the centre of the governance review we have been undertaking since August last year. Periodic reviews of our governance ensure our Federation has the best possible structures to achieve our mission. And as the world and our professional field continue to change, 
we must evolve to meet new demands and opportunities. Of course, structure alone cannot guarantee the success of our mission and strategy. We know that it is your continued energy and your engagement that is the key factor in that. But a fit for purpose structure can enable success and make it more likely. So I want to start by saying thank you for the time and energy you contribute to making IFLA the vibrant community of library professionals and leaders that it is. And thank you for your many contributions to this governance review. You are the architects of this new structure. Before outlining the key features of the proposal, I will briefly tell you how we arrived here. You will remember that at last year's General Assembly, the IFLA strategy 2019 to 2024 was launched. Immediately following this, and in line with the development roadmap, the new governing board started its work on reviewing IFLA's governance. We defined the scope of the review, which was to discover the structure and operations of the governing board, the professional committee and units, and the strategic committees. These are the bodies that steer and carry out the work of our federation. We then formed three work groups for each of these areas and all governing board members participated in one of the groups. I chaired the governing board work group, PC Chair Vicky MacDonald, the professional structures group and president elect Barbara Lisson, the strategic committees work group. The governing board agreed on six key principles to guide our work. The first question each working group addressed was, do our current structures best enable us to achieve the actions of the strategic plan? And if not, what are the problems that need to be addressed? To establish our goals, we surveyed you, our members and volunteers, to learn what was the most important to you in this governance review. In response, you said you wanted to see more transparency, efficiency and collaboration, stronger regional representation, greater financial and organisational sustainability, more varied opportunities for participation, especially for new leaders, and better support for volunteers. We also looked at comparable organisations, we talked with stakeholders, and we reviewed key pieces of work, including the global vision, the membership survey, and input received during the creation of our strategy. This input helped us to come up with possible solutions to the key problems identified and develop different options to consider. And it was at this point that it became clear that we did need a new regional structure to raise the profile of regions and better respond to regional priorities. Each work group brought their options to a workshop at our governing board meeting in December. And this was the last time we met together physically. Following these discussions, the work groups started to refine their proposals. This was done in close consultation with the steering committee, which comprised the chairs of each of the work groups and the secretary general and parliamentarian. This resulted in the first draft of a governance proposal which was published in June for consultation. We then conducted a second survey to get your feedback on the key concepts of this proposal and to seek input on a number of open questions. There was a great response in the number of you who replied and also in the detail and fullness of your answers. You showed strong support for the general concepts put forward and you helped us to develop our ideas further by sharing more detailed views and concerns through the survey and also through letters and emails. We took all of these into consideration in revising the proposal. Because of your input, we removed the governing board's power to co-opt members to the board, putting that power back into members' hands through direct election. 
we agreed that the Committee on Standards and the Cultural Heritage Program Advisory Committee should continue to report directly to the Governing Board. And we committed to working more closely with members to understand better the opportunities and challenges involved in creating new regional divisions. We also published answers to the most common questions and gave further explanation of concepts that weren't as clear as they could have been. We then engaged with you in a deeper discussion of governance through 11 virtual roundtables. Thank you to the hundreds of you who made time to join us for these discussions, to ask questions and share your views. So now let's take a look at the proposed governance structure, beginning with the governing board. The governing board will have 11 members a size that will allow for more participatory discussion and debate and effective strategic leadership for our Federation. The majority of the governing board will be directly elected by members. In addition to the president and president elect, the treasurer will now also be directly elected and there will be five elected members at large. And there'll be three members who serve because of their positions the Chair of the Professional Council, the new Regional Council, and the Management of Library Association section. The Governing Board will have three committees. These are the Professional Council, the new Regional Council, about which I will say more later, and the new Finance and Risk Committee, which will be chaired by the Treasurer. The Finance and Risk Committee will be strengthened by the addition of an external member with expertise in auditing and relevant Dutch law. Governing board members will be funded for travel and accommodation to attend two physical governing board meetings outside the Congress. This is to ensure that no one is present, prevented from serving on the board for financial reasons. And we will continue to work on improved communication and transparency and to introduce new practices for stronger accountability, such as regular board self-evaluation and training. The professional committee will be renamed the professional council and be organizationally aligned with the new regional council. The basis of the professional structure remains professional divisions comprised of professional units. The composition of professional divisions will be flexible and the structure can respond to the changing library environment. All professional divisions will have a similar number of professional units to ensure that division chairs can support and work closely with all of their units and to enhance communication and collaboration. To increase the opportunities for librarians to engage with IFLA, there will now be three mechanisms for progressing professional work beyond sections, and they are special interest groups, working groups and networks. And these will provide different levels of flexibility in addressing emerging issues for the profession. Procedures will be strengthened for transparent and regular review of committees and other structures. One of the most profound changes to come out of the governance review is the new regional council. As the global voice for the library and information field, you told us loudly and clearly that stronger regional representation must be a priority. And so IFLA is introducing a regional council that will mirror the professional council. It will be made up of the chairs of regional divisions. The purpose of our regional council and divisions is to ensure that regional priorities and concerns are heard and listened to within IFLA. It will coordinate work at a regional level to strengthen advocacy, in particular with the regional efforts for the United Nations 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. And it will support the visibility, coherence and effectiveness of IFLA's wider work. To form this new council, the current professional division five regions will be upgraded in size and responsibilities. 
the three professional sections representing the regions of Africa, Asia, Oceania, and Latin America and the Caribbean will be elevated to regional divisions. So that all re global regions are represented on the Council, there will be new divisions for Europe and North America and for the Middle East and North Africa region. This new MENA region brings together a group of countries which form a single United Nations political region and share a language. IFLA has recently treated MENA as a separate region, including with the Global Vision Initiative and the International Advocacy Program. IFLA's global work is currently supported by four committees referred to as strategic committees. They focus on freedom of access to information and freedom of expression, copyright and other legal matters, standards and cultural heritage. For clarity and simplification, they will now be known as advisory committees and their composition, that is, the number of core members and the way they are appointed will be standardised. All four committees will report to the governing board. I am excited by these new ideas and look forward to IFLA's future. Of course, we have procedural steps ahead of us before we can see these changes occur. First, we must amend our statutes by vote of the General Assembly. Second, we must update our rules of procedure by vote of the Governing Board. The rules provide further detail on processes building on the statutes. And third, the Governing Board will produce a handbook to guide all our IFLA volunteers in understanding and implementing the statutes and the rules. IFLA has consulted a Dutch legal expert to assist in this process. She has advised that our current statutes are overly complex and can be modernised and simplified. We want these statutes to stand for 10 to 15 years. They must guide the work of IFLA and provide clarity, flexibility and the ability to adapt to whatever circumstances may arise. In mid-February next year, there will be another General Assembly called to approve these new statutes. Following the result of this vote, nominations will then be called for the Federation's governing bodies 2021 to 2023. I want to thank you all for your interest and enthusiasm. Despite the constraints imposed by this unprecedented pan pandemic, IFLA's board, staff, volunteers and members have continued the important work of the Governance Review. I would like to especially acknowledge my colleagues on the Governing Board who have spent a great deal of time on Zoom, often late at night or early in the morning, to ensure robust debate and thorough consideration of the important questions before us. I would also like to thank the members of the Steering Committee Barbara Leeson and Vicky MacDonald, Secretary General Gerald Leitner and IFLA Parliamentarian Martin Wade and the IFLA staff. We have been ably assisted in the project by Megan McNally from Luma Consulting. And most of all, I would like to thank everyone who has contributed their ideas, comments and critiques to ensure that we have arrived at the best outcome we could this new proposed governance structure for IFLA. We have indeed worked together for IFLA and for the global library field. Thank you, Christine, for that clear explanation of the new governance structure and how we will go on. It has been a fascinating journey and your leadership has been essential in keeping us on track and coming to this final result with the statutes. I know by working together, we will deliver a more inclusive and participatory organization for our members. Thank you, Chris. Next on our agenda is item number 12, concerning motions and resolutions. I invite the Secretary General to present the rationale and motion to approve 
the holding of the next General Assembly in August 2021. Gerald, please. Members, the legislation of the Netherlands, as stated in the Dutch Civil Code, Part 2, Section 48 and 49, requires that the governing board must submit an annual report and annual financial statements to the General Assembly within six months of the end of the financial year, unless the General Assembly has extended this period. The period may be extended on account of special circumstances for no more than five months. This is reflected in Article 8.2 of IFLA's statutes. IFLA's financial year ends on 31st December and its General Assembly meets during the Congress, normally in August, more than six months later. The General Assembly must therefore authorize the governing board to present the annual report and financial statements at the next Congress. IFLA's lawyers advise that this authorization has to be given every year, a blank authorization is not permissible. The government board calls upon the General Assembly to vote on the following motion regarding the next General Assembly in August 2021. That the General Assembly authorizes the governing board to convene the General Assembly to coincide with the next IFLA World Live and Information Congress, which shall take place in August 2021. In the case of an unavoidable delay, the General Assembly may be convened at a later date, but not no later than 30 November 2021. Thank you, Secretary General. I now call for a mover and a seconder for the motion. The motion as presented is moved by Lili Knibbler and seconded by Tonya Arachova. We will now move to formal vote. Please stay with us while the vote takes place. The result is 1,377 votes in favor, no, zero votes against and two abstentions. The motion has been resolved in the affirmative. Thank you very much. On the advice of IFLAS lawyers, based on Dutch law around the conduct of general assemblies, the governing board has decided to withdraw motion 12.2. The lawyers have nonetheless indicated that recent reforms create opportunities to allow for electronic voting on resolutions on the table at general assemblies, which must in any case still be held in physical form. This is welcome news, as it provides an alternative means of achieving the goal of maximizing the, the possibilities for all members to engage in decision-making at IFLA. To implement these possibilities, new text will be incorporated into the proposed new IFLA statutes and voted on at the Extraordinary General Assembly in February 2021. Beforehand, an advisory ballot of, Islav, of IFLAV members has been launched already on the 30th of October with the deadline of January 30th, 2021. I now invite the Secretary General to, to present the motion 12.3 to propose to the Governing Board to investigate alternative and sustainable ways to conduct future WLIC and arrange WLIC as global event only every third year. Gerald, please. The Swedish and Norwegian library associations have submitted this resolution to the General Assembly. Their motivation reads, the World Library and Information Congress, BLIC, is of vital importance to the global library community. Librarians and information specialists from all over the world interact to develop library services and advocacy. Unfortunately, 
The annual blick also generates carbon pollution from the long distance flying and the expensive traveling enables many librarians in the world to participate. IFLA is a strong advocate for the Agenda 2030, so it would be appropriate for its own Congress to be organized as a sustainable event. Some associations have gone far to have sustainable international conferences, implementing a multi-location approach in which participants travel to a regional hub closer to home. For example, the 15th International Conference on Music Perception and Cognition in 2018 was organized on several locations on four continents. Each hub held its own keynote speakers and panel sessions, but the hubs also connected with each other for virtual panel sessions and discussions. Conference organizers reported that under the same virtual approach, the number of countries represented increased by 50% and per capita carbon pollution was reduced 70% compared to a traditional international conference. We proposed to the governing board to investigate alternative and sustainable ways to conduct future BLIC and arrange BLIC as a global event on only every third year. So the motion of the Swedish and Norwegian Library Association. Thank you, Gerald. I now ask Karin Linder, director of the Swedish Library Association to speak to the resolution. Karin, please. Dear General Assembly, I'm the Secretary General of the Swedish Library Association and my name is Karin Linde. And today in this meeting, I also speak for the Norwegian Library Association. We wrote this motion together, arguing for a more sustainable look before the pandemic. It is a motion written in line with the measures taken by our, our associations to work in a positive way for the sustainable development goals. The pandemic has now shown us and forced us to meet and discuss in new and different ways. And I'm sure that all of us can see both negative and positive sides of those new kind of meetings. It is a delicate work to find out how to use this experience in the very best way. However, we are confident that the governing board will make wise decisions on how to organize LIC in the best sustainable way in the future and we do understand that this work might take some time since it is a complex, complex task. Said that, I offer the governing board all the support and help you might need for this work. And thank you for giving us time to speak to the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Karin. Following the publication of the agenda for the 2020 IFLA General Assembly on 20th October, a procedure for submitting questions regarding the subject on the agenda of the 2020 IFLA General Assembly was established. Answers have been collected, reviewed and published on IFLA's webpage. One question was asked regarding motion 12.3. I cite the question. One of the agenda items is motion to propose to the governing board to investigate alternative and sustainable ways to conduct future VLIC and arrange VLIC as a global event only every third year. This sounds like the decision was already been made to only hold VLIC every three years. What inputs has been or will be sought on the pros and cons of such a decision? This was the question, and now I'm pleased to give you the answer of our governing board. The governing board discussed the question in the governing board meeting on 27th October and provides the following answer. No decision has been made about changing the frequency of EFLA congresses. We are currently planning for annual conferences for at least the next three years based on agreements and their relevant contracts with our partners. However, a priority for the coming years in line with the EFLA strategy is to explore changes in our Congress models in order to ensure that it responds to the needs of EFLA and its members and wider global considerations. As part of this process, the governing board 
would carry out extensive consultations exploring the pros and cons of a change in the frequency of LIX2, so our governing board. Thank you, Secretary General. Thank you for this explanation. Does any member present wish to speak to the motion? Seeing none, I now call for a mover and a seconder for the motion. The motion as presented is moved by Lili Knibbler and seconded by Tonya Arachava. We will now move to a formal vote. Please stay with us while the vote takes place. Now we got the voting. The result in favor is 753 uh, against 395 and 231 abstentions. Thank you very much. As the motion has reached majority, the governing board will undertake further work and investigations into sustainable ways to hold the WLAC. The governing board will carry out extensive consultations, exploring the pros and cons of a change in the frequency of WLICs, and of course, will keep members informed about the progress. Thank you. As we come to item number 13, I would like to ask our Secretary General to inform us about future World Library and Information Congresses. Gerald, please. Dear colleagues, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused and continues to cause major disruptions to societies and economies around the world. Faced with this, libraries have shown extraordinary resilience and effectiveness in order to continue to serve users. IFLA is working to do the same with enhanced online support to our members and volunteers. The pandemic also challenges us to think again about how we work both individually and collectively into the future. This is particularly true in our planning for the World Library and Information Congress, the most international event in the library calendar. Faced with continued uncertainty about the health, economic and travel situation in 2021, it already seems clear that business as usual is not an option. This is not, however, a reason to stop, but rather to accelerate our work to create a new model for our Congress in line with the EFLA strategy. In doing so, we can also address the increasingly pressing issues of the carbon footprint associated with Congress participation and the difficulty we know that many face in attending in person, even in normal times. The Foreign of First for IFLA, the 2021 World Live and Information Congress will be held online as part of an accelerated drive to develop a new, more inclusive format for the most international event in the library calendar. We are happy to announce that our 2021 Congress will take place virtually with the welcome support of the Dutch National Committee. Many thanks to you for your tremendous support. The physical conference previously planned in Rotterdam, the Netherlands will move to 2023 and take place in a hybrid online in-person format. And we continue to plan for an in-person conference in Dublin, Ireland in 2022 with a strengthened online element Many thanks to our Irish colleagues. These are exciting times. We are building a new type of World Live and Information Congresses, following the same principles of transformation and inclusion that have shaped our vision and strategy and are shaping our governance review. Our goal is to develop a program and a format that combines the best aspects of our traditional conferences with the possibilities that digital tools bring to include all members 
of our field all around the world meaningfully. Achieving success will require the best of our creativity and experience. We look forward to working with members, volunteers and participants to deliver this. I'm sure we will have even more exciting blicks in the future. And we look very much forward to welcoming you to our next Congresses in new formats. I think we are all very interested and excited about IFLA's first virtual World Library and Information Congress next year. We sincerely hope that we can meet again post-COVID-19 in Dublin and then in Rotterdam. This brings us to the close of our assembly. I would like to thank you for your understanding of this extraordinary situation. Our extensive thanks go to the National Library of the Netherlands for their support with the meeting venue and organization, and especially to the director, Lili Knibbeler, for providing an alternative proxy choice and attending as proxy holder today, which is actually her birthday. Happy birthday, Lily. <laughs> I pass on the best wishes of President Christine McKenzie and those of, on those of all of the governing board to IFLA members. Through these challenging times, we have seen our profession rise to meet the situation head on. It has brought at our, out our creative and innovative side as we work to meet the needs of our community. We will endure and we will get through this. Let's work together we are IFLA. And my last remarks go to the Secretary General and to his team. Thank you very much for the work and time and efforts and nerves you have invested to make this General Assembly possible and give so many colleagues the opportunities to participate. I now formally close the IFLA General Assembly 2020 and wish you all the best. Stay healthy. Let's work together and let's meet again. Thank you very much. <laughs>